Samuel chapter 23 and God's glory in the wilderness. Have you ever watched just TV and seen those survival shows that have these, like there's all kinds of them out there. Some I've, I saw and they drop these guys off in the middle of like Alaska and then they have this beacon and if, and if it gets really bad, they press the beacon and the helicopter comes and takes them away. But what's interesting is that there's a camera crew out there the whole time probably completely stocked by living in a cabin, you know, or a nice tent, and they've got all the food and provisions. And so they have, like, food right there. So it's not real survival. It's not like somebody going out on their own and really struggling for their life because they have people right there at the ready. But I just think those shows are really fascinating, and I don't know if you enjoy those as much as I do. But as you're out there watching, just trying to live off the land, trying to hunt for your own food, trying to get find your own water, trying to find shelter— and, and all of it's just to be safe and, and take care of yourself. And, and the one thing you're thinking of, it's not like how to build an advanced civilization. That's not what's going through your mind. It's how to put food in my belly today. This moment, how do, I, how do I do this? How do I make this happen? And I think that's just really interesting. And I think as we think through the spiritual life, the Christian life, there are times when we are also in the wilderness. And it just feels like we are just trying to survive. Every day, every moment, where do we find our next, our next meal, nourishment, just dependence, utter, absolute, just dependence upon the Lord. And I think as we've been walking through the book of Samuel, we see David go from this place in the kingdom where he saw his armor bearer, been anointed king, and now his very mentor and father figure, Saul, is after him trying to take his life. And, and David is on the run. And we'll see in David and his character that he won't touch Saul. He won't fight Saul, even though he is a great warrior. He's a great leader of men. He has done all these things, and he's just trying to survive. And I think just translating this to that for today, um, there are times when we're going to go through wilderness experiences. There are times in the Christian life where it's just hard. And no matter how you try to spin it, no matter what, what angle you look at it, and people you know, say all kinds of encouraging things toward you, it's just, it's still hard. It's still hard. And there's a very easy thing for us to do, and, and, and we could say, oh, well, it's not, it's not that bad, or it's not really that difficult, or, or God's, God's good, and he is good through all of it, but we kind of maybe try to skip over the surface and kind of give some like icing to, to something that really is a hunger for our soul when really we need meat, we need something deep. And many times in Christianity, there's a shallow, I say called shallow Christianity, which is not Christianity at all, and there's something much deeper. Shallow Christianity is about, man, my life, I just want to make it more comfortable. I want things, I want to be more healthy. I want to be more prosperous. God, I just need more. Can you just give me something that is going to be good to make my life better? And, and to be quite honest, there are times when those things, you look at that and go, man, that's not going to suffice. That's not going to give me what my deep heart longing and brokenness in my heart is going to, to need and fulfill. That's the only thing that can fill that hole in your heart is God. God's the only thing that can fill, fulfill that place, that deep longing in your heart, is the relationship with the Father Almighty. Just think about this just for a second. God, in Genesis chapter 1, he speaks and things are created. Boom! universe. Boom, light, planets, people, animals. All this is just like popping up all over the place with God's word, just like that. He creates man in a garden, and he makes it really good. And, and man's having this great time over here in this garden, a beautiful garden, and he gives him just one simple command. Don't eat of this tree. What do you think man, do, man does? We know the story. He goes and eats that tree. Sin, brokenness, death enters the world because of Adam's sin. Because of that, we live in a broken and fallen world. And we have this terrible heart condition of sin that causes this separation between us and God. And so this brokenness that we feel in our hearts is just sitting there, broken, broken, broken. And the only restoration that can happen to our broken and, and our souls is this relationship with God the Father. And so what he does is he sends his son Jesus to go on a cross and suffer the full wrath of God upon his shoulders so that he can restore this broken and fallen world. And then he goes, I want you to be a part of my kingdom. 
and he reaches out and extends his grace to us, saving us, redeeming us, adopting us into his family as children. And then he goes, I want you to pray to me. I want you to, to talk to me and have this relationship where you were once an enemy. Now you're my child, and I've brought you into the kingdom. And this is what God does to us and for us. And this is the relationship we have. And, and I think, like, how cool would it be? Just, have you ever thought about this? Like, what would it be like just to win the lottery? How awesome would that be? Like, I would love to get $400 million just handed to me. Yes, that would sound awesome. All my problems would go away. Everything would be great. But the truth is, problems wouldn't go away. They would change. Instead of it being like, how do I put food on the table? Because I've got to pay for this payment or that payment. Then it's, okay, what do I do with all this? How do I not let these things become an idol and, and everything else that goes along with that? Those things don't solve the problem that only God can solve. And I think what wilderness experiences teach us is it's a reminder of our basic core need as human beings. We all need the Lord. We all need Jesus, and we need him to fix the brokenness in, inside of all of us. Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 23 and start in verse 1. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord, and again, Lord again, and the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled down to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut, him, shut himself in by entering a town that has, has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. And David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul comes, seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your ser servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. And then David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. I'm going to stop right there and just kind of, kind of walk through this little section um, to see about David's faith in the wilderness. If you've kind of been with us in 1 Samuel, I'll kind of catch you up to speed. Um, again, David is on the run from his father figure mentor, Saul. David has done nothing wrong to Saul. He has only served in every way that he's been asked to serve. David, uh, Saul has actually put some crazy demands upon David. You know, hey, if you want to marry my daughter, and he tries to marry, his, marry off his daughter to David to, to kind of try to appease him and think, okay, David's not going to take my kingdom and all this other stuff. And, and then all of a sudden he says, you want you to kill all these Philistines. And if you kill the Philistines, then yes, you can have this marriage price for my daughter. And he thinks in that David's going to possibly even die fighting the Philistines. David goes out, not only does exactly what Saul asks, but he doubles it. Saul says, I want you to kill 100 of our enemies. David kills 200 of the enemies. And, and comes back and says, I'm just here to serve you. Everything David has done has been in service of, his, of the king. Done nothing wrong. Saul, in his jealousy and in his rage and his envy, has been consumed by the possibility of losing his kingdom to David. Doesn't want it to happen. We see it because he, he wants his own son Jonathan to take the throne. But, but the whole irony of the situation is that Jonathan doesn't want it. He realizes David's supposed to be the next king. And Jonathan's made a covenant with David as a good friend of David to say, no, David, the kingdom belongs to you. I'm not going to side with my father in this. What he's doing is wrong. I've made a covenant to you. I'm going to protect you. So Jonathan is his eyes and ears in the kingdom. He's told David it's not safe for you. David is on the run. He's on the run from the very country that he has served and fought for so faithfully. So much so that he actually goes to the enemy king, the Philistines, at his absolute rock bottom, and tries to stay there. And at this point, 
king is about to kill him, and David has to act crazy just to get out of that situation. And this is where David's at. And now David is in the wilderness. In that, he also, and we'll see this too, and I'll talk a little about this in a second, a group of men have started to surround David. If you're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 22, and down in verse 1 and 2, it says, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, he went, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there was with him about 400 men. So we see the process of David starting to attract these guys. What's interesting about these guys they were in distress, they were in debt, bitter in soul, and they all gathered to him. Common, commonalities. And this was David's core group. And we're going to look at, kind of in a second, just kind of what those guys eventually become. But I, I just think this just paints the picture. He's not gathering a group of guys that are confident, ready to overthrow Saul. They're all a group of guys just looking for survival. This is the wilderness experience. He goes and Um, David, as he's in the wilderness with these guys in verse 1, chapter 23, he sees that a group of Philistines fighting a neighboring town of Keilah. Keilah is a town that that eventually becomes part of Judah, Israel, um, but it's kind of on the border between Judah and and the Philistine lands. So again, it's kind of safe for David maybe to be there on the the border of the enemy area and surrounding kind of uh, cities and towns, along with Keilah. But he sees Philistines going after, you know, they're from Judah. They're his people, and he sees this attack. Now, what's interesting and ironic is that who's supposed to be protecting this city? Saul. Saul's supposed to be protecting this city. David's in the wilderness with his group of of guys that are all bitter and distressed, all 400 of them, and he sees this attack, and he, I'm sure he has compassion on his, the people, his people. So what does he do? Verse 2, he inquires of the Lord, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. Now remember, David's in survival mode with his group of guys. In verse 3, but David's men said to him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? So just picture this. These guys are coming here for him for survival, and they're saying, we're afraid here for our lives in Judah. You want us now to go to attack the Philistines? And David's like, yes. God told us that's what we need to do, and we need to do it. So this group of guys, they go out, and they do exactly of what the Lord said. Again, David, verse 4, acquires the Lord. The Lord answers him, goes to go down to Keilah, for I'll get the Philistines into your hand. In verse 5, And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of of Keilah. David, in his survival mode, goes out and wins this great victory. Now, just, just picture this for a second. All 400 of these guys who are starting to come together around David, and, and I think at this point there's 600 guys. So he's starting to gain more, building more of a group of guys that are here in the wilderness. And they're just here for survival. David leads them to a great victory. They bring back livestock. They get to see God's hand of mercy and and grace and provision for the people of Keilah, as well as David being able to to help do what he's been called to do, which is protect his people, serve and uh, serving God and following him and what he's called them to do. Now, this group of guys, this ragtag group of warriors, I want to just show you just a fast forward. And I don't want to take a whole lot of time on this, but I just want to show you what God does and how he works through ordinary people to bring about extraordinary results. 2 Samuel 23, and we're going to read verses 8. Now again, this isn't probably all of his guys yet. They're still starting to pile in and follow David little by little. But this is what his, his guys are. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb, Beshebeth, a, a Tachamanite. He was chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. And next to him among the three mighty men was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ahohai. 
He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. And the next to him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot ground of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. And three of the thirty chief men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the Bethlehem, from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the mighty men, then the three mighty men, broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord and said, Far be it for me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things the mighty men did, three mighty men did. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of the thirty. And he wielded a spear against three hundred men and killed them and won a name beside the three. He was the most renowned of the thirty and became their commander, but he did not attain to the three. And Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, was a valiant man of Kabzeel, a doer of great deeds. He struck down the two aerials of Moab. He also went down and struck down a lion in a pit on a day when snow had fallen. And he struck down an Egyptian, a handsome man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but Benaiah went down to him with the staff and snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and won a name beside the three mighty men. He was renowned among the thirty, but he did not attain to the three. And David set him over his bodyguard. Again, this is the beginning of those guys. Just think about that. God's moving. God's working, taking these men and through David, the Holy Spirit, empowering and building and strengthening and making just a powerful force that is just fighting and, and just unstoppable. This is the beginning in the wilderness. And I, and I don't mean to overplay this, but I, I really feel as though some of the most difficult experiences in our, in our lives are some of the best experiences for God to work through us and to reveal in us and to forge in us a spirit of sanctification, of holiness, of righteousness that follows after God no matter what, of courage, of boldness, that the world can't understand or know. But we live in a culture that teaches us that wilderness experiences and bad circumstances are something that is terrible, that we shouldn't go through. You don't want to walk through those things. If you walk through those things, and God obviously does not love you, doesn't care about you, we just want comfort. We want security. We want very simple, shallow things. Our, our desires and our, our, our expectations are just so weak, so small. In fact, C.S. Lewis said it when he said this, this quote, and I love this because it's exactly who we are. He says, in the weight of glory, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by, at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. The things we want so much in this world pale in comparison to the infinite joy that Christ promises and he's offering to us with this relationship with him the brokenness in our heart that we are trying so hard to fulfill as if we are just baking mud pies in a slum. God's offering us something much, much, much greater. And again, taking ordinary people to do extraordinary things so that God ultimately gets the glory for that. The second thing I want to see here about David's faith is, again, this expression is used a lot in this passage, but in David inquiring of the Lord, David inquiring of the Lord, what is he trying to do every step along the way? David wants to make sure that what he is doing is ordained and followed by the Lord. God is telling him, this is what I want you to do, David. Go out and serve. Go out and attack. David doesn't 
fall into the maybe a fleshly desire that says, I want to sit here and survive and be with these guys and just protect these guys here in the wilderness from Saul, we're going to go out and attack. I think in that we see this whole idea of a, dependence of, a dependent heart on prayer. In the wilderness, that's what we do. We teach, God teaches us that we must be dependent upon the Lord. How often do we, you just pray? Just pray to God. Just like, just think about that for a second. Just how often do you just pour out your soul before the holy and almighty God? Just telling him absolutely everything that is on your mind and the deepest burden of your soul. I'll be honest, the last couple of weeks in our life, and those of you, some some of you know our story, some of you don't, but we just, our daughter, diagnosed with spina bifida, and it's been this whirlwind for us. We've gone just thinking everything's good, everything's not good. Everything's good, it's not good. Good, not good. And it's just one thing after another, and our hearts have just been an emotional roller coaster. And I think just through this whole process, I don't think I've prayed more in my life than the last few weeks of my life. I'm sad to say that, but I'll tell you this, that God has, through this experience, created a much more dependent heart for me upon the Lord and realized that I need Jesus every single day. And that I have to pr- I pray to him, pouring out my soul to him. You read the Psalms and read what David went through as he's being chased around by Saul. David pours out his heart to the Almighty God, believing that God is hearing his prayer. And even when he doesn't believe God is hearing his prayer, he gets to the point of understanding that God is hearing and he is with him. He's with him. The Almighty God who created heaven and earth by speaking into existence is with us. And even when it feels like he is not there, he is there. If you are a follower, you're a child of God. God is with you. He's with you. Even when it feels like he's not, he's there. Prayer helps us, reminds us that the Almighty is with us. That the Holy Spirit of God indwells inside of us and he has not forsaken you. He's, he's not blind or he doesn't hear, he's not deaf to what we are petitioning to him. He sees very intimately and deeply the sorrows and burdens of our soul in the brokenness of our hearts. He knows what you are going through and he is not forgetting it. I think prayer teaches us what it means to pour our hearts out to the Lord upon dependence upon him. We see that here in David's faith and for for this wilderness experience. Shallow Christianity says that God's in the business of granting parking lots, swimming pools, jets, and mansions. But I'll tell you this, rich, deep Christianity tells us that God's in the process of restoring the deepest problem of our soul, the brokenness of our hearts. And those things are nice, but it doesn't fix the brokenness in which we desperately need. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Do you have faith in those mud pies that are going to make you happy playing in the dirt to my kids? I love that, that quote because, man, the, the best toy in the world is just a big dirt hill. My boys could play in dirt and my daughter could too forever. Just playing in the dirt, playing in the dirt. It's like, I don't need any toys. I just take my hands and scoop up some dirt and make something out of this, and this is great. It's awesome. In fact, you have to try to get my youngest son in from outside when he's playing in the dirt, and it's like, man, I've, I've told him, like you're getting a spanking or something. Like he hates it. He's like, why would you punish me like that? I love this dirt. I just want to play in the dirt. And I'm like, and on one hand, I'm like, I love the simplicity of that. Like he just, just dirt satisfies him. Like I wish for the days when you're just like an adult and you just go out there and play in the dirt and be happy. Like I'm just, I'm, what are you doing, honey? Oh, I'm just playing in the dirt. I'm just making a little uh, sand castle in the backyard. I'm okay. Like you're like, I, I need to call somebody. This is not right. You know, like we're, it's just not who we are as people. But kids, they love that. You know, they just enjoy that all day long. And I think sometimes we're, we're like that, just like that. We enjoy playing in the dirt. These simple things of life that we think, oh, this isn't going to satisfy me. If I just had like $500 more dollars a month, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. You'd be upset again when you wound up spending that $500 a month again. Oh, if I just had $1,000 more a month, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't because you'd spend that and you'd be unhappy again because you'd be in debt over something else. It's like we just go in this big circle. Like if, this, if I had this, it'll make me happy won't make you happy because your problem is not those things. Your problem is the brokenness in your soul because you need to depend upon a holy, holy God. And God reveals that to us in times of wilderness. Take it all away, boom, I realize I need the Lord. I've used this example before, but we have some friends, some close friends, and 
Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans hit, wiped out a whole city. And people's houses got, I mean, just wiped off their foundations. I mean, it was just crazy to see the power of what nature did. In the middle of this, we had some friends and they lost everything. God actually used that experience to bring them to the Lord. I mean, through that, they realized that this house, their possessions, all these things that they thought they needed, they didn't need. And like, what is, it, what is this life, you know, down to if we don't have those things? What do, we, what do we cling to? What do you belong to? We belong to the Lord. And, and when God has called us out of darkness, when he has saved us from the brokenness of our sin and redeemed us and restored us, and we have a relationship with the Almighty, you have everything you need. You don't need anything else because you have the Lord Almighty who is on your side, who will fight your battles for you, who is going to bat for you, who is defending you. He's, he's with you. What else do we need? And I think so much, we just go back to, we just want the dirt. I just want this dirt. Why can't I have the dirt? God's like, man, I've got so much more to show you. I've got so much better than just this dirt. Faith in the wilderness. The second part here we see here is God's provision in the wilderness. How does God take care of us? How does he provide for us? See in David in verse 14. And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness. In the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph, and Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this, and the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. Before we get back, I just realized we can explain a little bit, kind of fill in the gaps here. Um, verse 6, kind of on to 14, or verse 13. There's a couple things I want to explain. Abiathar, again, if you remember last week, and Saul goes in and kills all the priests of Nob, so, uh, priest at Nob. Um, Abiathar escapes. He's one of the priests there. Again, the priest's job was to, to speak on behalf of the people to God. And you think of what the difference between a priest and prophet in those days. Um, kind of very, a little nuance, a lot more nuance than this, but prophet would speak on behalf of God to the people, priests would speak on behalf of the people to the Lord, petitioning, and this is the way that they would atone for sin, and ultimately leading up to Christ coming back. And so a priest would do that for the people. And Saul kills all these priests in this town, except for Abiathar, son of Ahimelech. He escapes, he comes down, and again, Saul hears about David and Keilah. Saul comes down, and Keilah surrounds it, or, or he wants to come down and plans on surrounding it. See David shut in. He thinks, I've got him. David inquires of the Lord, and ephod is a, is a priestly garment. It's what they wore. Again, it's, it's just something the priests would wear. They were told to wear in the Old Testament, Old Testament law. And David with Abiathar, he's consulting God. And how God has told him to consult him was through the priest. So David does that, and he asks, asks God, what do we do? And he said, he asked, will the people of Keilah basically surrender us if they are besieged? And he says, yes, they will. And so David's like, okay, we got to get out of here. So David takes them in, all 600 of them. They depart Keilah in verse 13. And they went wherever they could go. And when Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. So he's like, okay, I thought I had him. I obviously don't have him here. I'm going to give up this expedition for this time. And then in verse 14, David remained in the strongholds of the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph, and Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. Yet in 14, we see this. God did not, was not going to give up David. See in verse 14, Saul sought him, but what? But God did not give him into his hand. I think this phrase here, we just need to stop and pause for a second. The theology that we need to understand about God's sovereignty and his control is that what God allows, he often allows all, many things that are often terrible. How do we explain that in the hands of God's loving and good character and nature? I don't know how all that plays out, to be 100% honest with you. Until the end of glory, we'll figure it all out. But I do know this. God's character is good. He is loving. He is righteous. He is holy. He is sovereign. 
He is all those things that he is. And here we see that God's plan was not a part of his plan to let David go into the hands of Saul. God was not going to give up David into the hands, hands of Saul. Does that mean that God never allows bad things? No, if you're part of this fallen and broken world, you see that. And us walking through this whole experience has taught me that we go through rough times, we go through hardships, we go through tough experiences. And it doesn't surprise God. God's in control of it all. He's in control of David walking through the wilderness. But he did not give Saul, or did not give David into the hands of Saul. He provided safety and security. And then we see this relationship with, with Jonathan, verse 16. John, Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. Jonathan is what you call one, like a once-in-a-lifetime kind of friend. This is the kind of friend that you want by your side, is a Jonathan. Jonathan is with Saul, and he's still with his father because he is following the commands of the king, where David would be if, if Saul wasn't trying to take his life. And he's following his dad, even though he disagrees 100% with the direction his, his dad's going in, but he's still going to protect David. And he, he goes out and meets his friend David, and he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. It's a covenant before the Lord David. Before the, before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. I just think I love that picture of that friendship. Jonathan comes along, David, in his weakness and his brokenness, and he says, God's not, or Saul's not going to find you. God's got you. He's going to protect you. We all need Jonathans. We all need friends like that. We all need someone to come alongside of us in the middle of our brokenness, but at the same time, we need to be Jonathans. I think Jonathan is one of those, those guys here and that we, his, his character all throughout the book of Samuel is just exemplary. I mean, just something that's just a model to follow. I think as we've walked through this whole thing with, with Caroline and Lindsay, and I just think about just our church and uh, how much just our church has just loved on us and how much that has just meant to us that we've seen that, we've watched that. And, and I just go, okay, God, I realize that we're not meant to walk through this life alone. We're not supposed to go through hardship alone. But you have placed sovereignly people around us that are holding us up and lifting us up, praying for us, carrying this burden with us. And that's huge. At some point in your life, if you haven't gone through it, you will. And you're going to need a Jonathan. One of the sayings Nick says, and he says to us to his kids a lot, is if you, want to, if you want good friends, you have to be a good friend. And I think as a follower of Jesus Christ, sometimes we miss that. We always we want the take. Yes, I realize I want a good friend to come around me, but that's, it's a reciprocal thing. You have to be a good friend. And, and I think in our consumeristic world, we all want give, 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 give. But are you giving? Are you being that friend to someone else in their hardship? Are you helping to walk along somebody when they're dealing and struggling? Um, you know, again, in, in a room this size, you know, I, I know that some of us, we're, we're easy, it's easy for us to give. Maybe some of it's harder to receive. Some of you guys, though, we, we just need to be good friends to other people. We need to be that Jonathan. God provides that through his church, his body. God walks alongside and says, I'm gonna, this time I'm going to help you walk through the wilderness by providing people around you to encourage you and to strengthen you. Again, so David's relationship with Jonathan helps him keep going on, keeps walking forward. In verse 19, Then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds of Horesh? on the hill of Hakila, which is south of Jeshimon. Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Just think about this. Now Saul is using God to justify his situation. Think about this. Both David and Saul are using the Lord to say, God has blessed us. God is with us. God is, David's inquiring of God. He's, he's seeking God. And Paul's telling the Ziphites here, God will surely bless you. Again, another, another ironic thing about Samuel, and this is the comparison there between Saul and David. How often do we use God to justify our actions? So, hear me out for a, sec, for a second. Maybe we're in this situation, more like David who realized, God, I'm inquiring of you. We, God, can you, can you, can you 
just help me through this brokenness and trying time. And other times, maybe we're like Saul. And we go, God, this is what I'm going to do. And now I'm going to use your name to make this even stronger. I've heard people say this phrase, and, and I, I'm just, get, I just it makes me just a little uncomfortable when we say this. But it will all start out with, God told me, and then blank. And they'll fill in the gap. Anytime you use that phrase, God told me, you better be 100% certain that God actually told you that. Because if you use that phrase, God told me, and then put something else in there that you just want to do, you are taking the Lord's name in vain. That is taking the Lord's name in vain. That's blasphemous. Because you are trying to get God to approve whatever you want to do. God's not in the business of just approving what you want to do. And there's many times, guys, it, I've, I've seen this, or maybe it's like, well, you know, I, I really think that, I don't know, justify whatever sin you want to justify. That it's clearly in Scripture. God says, this is how you're supposed to live. This is how you're supposed to believe. This is how you're supposed to act. And you go, well, that doesn't make me happy, though. So God would want me to be happy. Boom. Trump card. God said this, and I went. No, it doesn't work that way. What we want to do is we want to say, God, here I am. I realize I'm broken and I'm a sinner. God, what would you have me do? Am I following you? Am I glorifying your name? Am I living for you? And if God says, no, you're not, then guess what has to change? Not God, but you. You need to change to follow the Lord, and not God need to change to follow you. It doesn't work that way. When we make God into following and justifying our own actions, guess what? That's not God. You're making yourself God because then you start proclaiming to God who are, who, what you're supposed to do as Saul was as the king, justifying his actions to go after his enemy David, which David was never his enemy to begin with. David has not tried to even kill him or harm him at all. We'll see even later, David actually tries to save Saul's life. David's men are ready to kill Saul, and David protects Saul. And so Dave, Saul is, is so consumed by this, his own narrative of this world, of this jealousy and envy and all these things that he's like corrupt him and make this narrative around him. And so then he starts looking at this situation and go, David is his enemy and he hates him. And David actually is doing the exact opposite. He loves him. He still cares for him. He's still trying to protect him, take care of him. And Saul is using God's name to justify his actions. And you look at this, you look at this, and you go, man, this is if really, if we're going to be honest here, we don't really shouldn't sympathize with David or sympathize with David. We're really more sympathize with Saul because that's probably who we are. How often do you use God's name to justify your actions? It's not that bad. It's not, I mean, yeah, I realize it's in the Bible, but the Bible's old, and maybe we're interpreting it incorrectly. Maybe if you if you read it like this, and you try to make this spin on that, that Bible verse to make it fit your worldview. Okay, I like that better. No, the Bible should confront you in your sin and slap us right in the face. It should feel like you got punched in the stomach sometimes reading the Bible and go, man, that hurt. That hurt me. I need to change. I need to change. Because we want to be conformed constantly to the image of Christ. I've said this before, but again, through this whole process, God's revealed in our life, just my own life, just my own idols, small things, big things. You know, just think, think as a family, you think, because you have kids, and you think, my kids are, this is how they're going to be, this is how they're going to turn out. You know, my kids are going to become superstar athletes and get college scholarships and become, you know, professional football and basketball and players and all this other stuff. They're going to be millionaires, and that's what you think about as parents and your kids and all the good things they're going to be. And, and what we're doing is we have our own idols that we're placing on our kids, and we make them be, try to become something they're not supposed to be and not try to think through what God has for them and what he cares about. And I think even for my own, our own family, the idol of just having our family the way that I think our family's supposed to be. And God's saying, you know what? I've got something greater for you. What is that? And through that, God is sanctifying us. He's tearing down idols and he's helping us realize our dependence upon the Lord and he's providing that. God is giving us something greater than we have, could ask for. He's showing us, he's revealing us as we're playing in the dirt, all this magnificence around us and saying, I want to provide this for you, this infinite joy that you can have in me 
through me. And God is revealing that to us. God's provision is way better than anything we could ask for. So instead of trying to justify God or justify our actions by having God fit that, why don't we just say, God, where am I wrong? God, correct my thinking. Change my worldview. Change my actions. God, help me to follow you. God, we should be convicted. Conviction's not a bad thing. If this is right now is making you uncomfortable, that's not a bad thing. I just want to say that. Embrace that. Follow that. Because that's the Holy Spirit prompting you, saying that we are sinners in need of a holy God to fix this brokenness in our soul. That is good. That is good. If you ever talk to a psychologist or a counselor and they'll say, you know, like we can only help somebody, we can only tell somebody or help them get to this point, but we can't actually make them change. You can't force somebody to change. Again, it comes down to a point where you go, yes, this is what I need to do, and I need to embrace that and to do that. But you need to realize first that you're a sinner. And it's that kind of that dirty word, oh, did he say I'm a sinner? How dare he? I'm offended. You should be offended by your own sin and not by what I'm saying, because the Bible already says this. God has revealed this to our heart. We are broken people. And we need to be offended by our own sin instead of by someone else say that we are sinners. It's the only way that you're going to be able to embrace that brokenness and for God to fix that brokenness in your own soul. I'm a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. As we continue on in the Ziphites, and, and again, Saul is blessing, saying that God's going to bless them. And he says in verse 22, Saul saying this to the Ziphites, Go make yet more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he is very cunning. So I was telling the Ziphites, I want you to be my spies. David's cunning. He's, he can get out of things really easily. I need to know where he is. In verse 23, See therefore and take note of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with, some sure, with sure information. Then I will go with you, and if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. So David is, again, one step ahead of Saul. He's kind of running to the next place. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the, in the Arabah to the south of Jeshimon. And Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told, so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David went, and his men went on the other side of the mountain. It almost is a picture to me, almost like a, like Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner. It's like his Roadrunner is always just one step ahead of him. He's around the other side of the mountain. Saul and his army is coming after him. David just keeps getting ahead of Saul. Just one step ahead, one step ahead, one step ahead. In verse 26, and David was hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come. For the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. So Philistines come and attack. Finally Saul's like, I guess I have to protect my people and not pursue this guy that's done me no wrong. I guess I'll go do that. He goes, leaves David alone. David finally gets, at least temporarily, escape from Saul. We'll see as we continue on through the story, Saul's not done pursuing David. He just continues to pursue him. But in that moment, God takes, pulls Saul away. David's life is spared again. And again, God showing his provision, safety, and security for David in his life. And you think like, well, what, what is David like really going through his mind as he's going through these things? We don't have a clear account, but we do have the Psalms. And I really want to read um, Psalm... 54. And if your inscription in your Bible, it might say a little inscription next to Psalm 54. It says, To the choir master with stringed instruments, a mascal of David, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, is not David hiding among us. So we have probably, and this is again, this is described later, but probably what the Psalm that again, David wrote about his experience here, and this is what he says. O oh God, save me by your name, and vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer, give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me, ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. 
Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. How in the world can you give thanks to God in the middle of people coming after you, trying to take your life, that for you doing, doing nothing to deserve what you've deserved or what's coming to you? And David, he's just asking God to hear his prayer. Oh, God, hear my prayer. And I think sometimes when you're praying in the middle of the wilderness, you're just asking God, God, oh, God, I need you. Hear my prayer, hear my cry, hear my brokenness. God, fix what's broken inside of me. Fix this problem, fix this stress, fix everything that's going on around. I don't even know what I need, but God, I need you. David crying out to the Lord and just sharing his thoughts before a holy and mighty God. God is his helper, the upholder of his life. And I love this in verse six. I will give thanks to your, na your name, O Lord, for it is good. I think of the problem in the wilderness, if we're not careful, we forget the character of God. Because we start ascribing, there's no way God could allow bad things happen to me. And we forget that God is actually good. He is fully good. And because you are his child, he wants to bless you with good things. The problem is, we don't understand what good things really are. We have a hard time understanding what good means. Because we're playing in the dirt. And that's what we want. God wants us to glorify his name in the wilderness. We glorify him by following after him, by seeking his name and just sharing our heart before him, giving thanks to God for who he is. Our faith, God provides, and he gives us all those things that, that we need, even if we didn't ask for them. I know just in a room like this, I don't know where everybody is. Some of you may be going through this wilderness experience right now. You may feel like God is not around that he doesn't hear you, that he is not answering you, that he doesn't understand you, that he doesn't see you. You may even wonder if he's really there. He is. He's there, and he understands and he knows. Some of you may be like Saul, and that's how you've responded. All this stuff's happened. Well, fine, I'm going to go do my own thing. I've got to, I'm going to handle my own kingdom. I, I want to try to put this in my own hands, and, and God's going to bless it. He's going to make it happen according to my will. You need to repent if that's you to repent of your idolatry, of putting yourself in the position of king where only God deserves. Or maybe the other, other of you guys in the room, maybe you're going through that experience, just cry out to God, praying. He hears you, he listens. Some of you may need to start that whole relationship with God because you're not a follower of Christ. You need to go and, and cry out to him in dependence upon him, repentance and faith and belief in him. Um, I'll be in the back. Um, we'll be happy to talk with you. Couples will be back there. We'd love to just talk with you about what God is maybe pressing upon your heart today. You need someone to pray with you. We'd be happy to pray with you, pray for you, pray maybe through this wilderness experience, but know that God hears you. He is good. He is loving, but he is just. He's just.